a lot of things that I want to briefly go through, probably too quickly. We've got quite a lot of content this week, but I've also got a lot of content for next week. A um, couple of things though, first of all, organizationally, um, most of you have done the online quiz, okay? It's still open until 11.59 tonight. Um, if you haven't done it yet, do it, okay? It's just 20 questions, but you only have 30 minutes to do it. Um, and very importantly, it's one shot, you've got to go straight through it, okay? You can't back up. It's explicitly written in the instructions in advance on that. I've also done that in Introduction to Business. Um, one student wrote from Internet, um, Introduction Business wrote to me and said, how can we do it this way when we had Moodle in high school? Quite interesting. Um, we were able to flag questions and go backwards and forwards. Um, the reason is quite explicit. Uh, by randomizing the order that the questions come up and not allowing you to go backwards and forwards, to be perfectly honest, just makes it a little bit more difficult for people to do the questions collaboratively. Okay, um, I'm not stupid about um, the opportunities to screenshot questions and share them, um, but it's a little bit different when someone has to take the test um, honestly up front um, and then share their screenshotted um, questions where someone else is going to get all the benefits and they don't get any benefits, okay? Um, unless you can organize some very strict cartels so that you kind of reciprocate. Um, uh, when, when you can do it collaborative and you can go through together and you can see the same questions at the same time, that's obviously much more tempting. So I'm just, I'm just trying to make it um, mendoc a uh, pain in the neck to actually have to try and scam it. So remember, these are only 5%. Um, they're summative in a sense, but they're also formative. You know, it's really just about in, incentivizing people to engage with the material. Um, that the, uh, the bulk of the... Uh, grades are going to come from your two projects and the clear evidence of your engagement. Um, and I do have quite striking statistics on people's relative contributions to things like um, the forums, the group forums and whatnot, um, when people have accessed various materials, um, behind the scenes, uh, Moodle kind of works a little bit like what we see now with this digitized Chinese um, system of social credit, uh, where they can track exactly your level of engagement to your sense of responsibility. Um, even I feel I'm, I'm a little bit disconcerted by the extent of the metrics that I can actually generate um, on how people are engaging. Uh, one of the really striking things is that I see some people have somewhere between 10 to 20 times the level of engagement on things like the group forum um, than others. It disconcerts me when I see someone's posted 25 times and someone else in a group has posted zero times. Okay, um, so please uh, do get engaged. Of course, at the end, we're also going to do a little peer review mechanism thing too. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to give a full and frack, frank um, feedback in terms of how you think your group members, whether they um, uh, contributed in a positive way, they brought you down or they just were incredibly difficult to raise virtually. Okay, so let's go back to where we left off this relationship um, between text and image and particularly the question of the openness of an image and image selection. So I will go straight into screen share mode. Okay. Um, find what I want. Selection. Here we go. Okay, so we finished up with this notion of um, open story image, and uh, that's a little bit fraught. Uh, open images in general are often much more open than we think they are. We, we have a very clear message we want to communicate. Uh, we pick an image to, that fits with that, or alternatively, we have a very strong image and we project onto that image our own understanding of it, but other people might not read it in the same way. Okay, and uh, one of the uh, the most uh, surprising things I've found is on the odd occasion when you do share on social media a particular image that you think is deeply illuminating about whether it's someone's personality 
or whatever, and other people read it in a completely different way. I think we've all had these experiences. Very clever communications design can play with this, can play with the openness of it, as we saw with that particular um, ESPAC um, campaign image. Where we're on safer, safer ground, particularly because we can test it quite easily, is when we use visual metaphors. Okay, I mentioned here in the notes, um, a feather depicts lightness. This is used in a huge array of contexts. Generally, if you see five chilies on a menu, the implication is that it's going to be pretty spicy, right? Uh, I have actually wondered uh, in the past in SEALs when we list courses, I mean, in the past we had actually had course books these days, of course, you've just got the, um, the online course list, uh, whether we should come up with a similar visual metaphor for the intensity of the um, English speaking uh, level. So if you cop an Australian like me who talks like a machine gun, then I, I don't quite know what visual metaphor we would use, okay? Um, we, uh, yeah, you, you, maybe we, you can come up with some creative suggestions on that. that well, what is the equivalent of a mecha hayakuchi, um, super fast speaking native speaker, you know, the five chili metaphor there visually, you can think about that yourselves, okay? So these metaphors serve as, they're concrete metaphors that relate to states that can be experienced directly by the five senses. Similarly, as we, we value poetry for being able to uh, evoke through text something which is actually a much, much rich, richer ta tactile experience or visual experience or even more challenging, for, for example, aroma, how you can actually capture that with uh, text is a challenge, but we value the poet, for example, who can do this. Um, those of you who are into wine would know that tasting notes on wine, it has its own uh, very specific language related to it. And it's kind of easy to mock, but uh, the truth is when you talk about uh, wine and having elements of cigar box, um, for example, then, that actually is quite a meaningful thing in terms of the actual experience of the wine, but simply our vocabulary isn't fully developed to be able to uh, communicate a lot of these things that come to us in a very different sensory vein. Um, fragrance is particularly interesting. So, and of course, something like um, uh, wine tasting notes, it's only partially about the tasting, two in fact, two thirds or more of all uh, flavor is actually aroma. If you've had a bad cold and you know this, one of your favorite dishes, you eat it when you've got a cold, it just doesn't taste the same. It often doesn't taste of anything. Um, be alert, by the way, actually, if you completely lose your sense of taste and you have cold symptoms, that's actually one of the best predictors of having COVID-19. So if you find just a little bit cold-like, but to a remarkable degree of lost your sense of taste, you've got to be kind of worried about it. Uh, if you go to a website such as basenotes.net, which is uh, the most commonly used website for people in the fragrance industry and lovers of fragrance to blog about fragrances, to write reviews, you'll realize that uh, literally there is a, is a, uh, a language about fragrance to dis describe common elements, but often they're drawing parallels as well too with well-known fragrances. So it's, it's quite an interesting thing to see. But also there seems to be within the industry a particular love of trying to write poetically um, in addition to actually describing the particular scent. I don't see that necessarily in, in relation to wine reviews, but there's something about people who are drawn to fragrance and wanting to write about them, but they also want to be poets as well, I think. Um, now, it gets a little bit more difficult when we're talking about a, an element such as economy. How can we reduce economy to a visual metaphor? Uh, well, of course, we can do it with a dollar sign or a yen sign, for example. So if you put five yen uh, after a restaurant review, that's going to, uh, to hint to you that it's actually pretty expensive. You're going to have to use a lot of money. But this, this broader sense of economy of like cost performance or cospa um, in Japanese, how do you actually turn that into a visual metaphor? That's a, that's a trickier one. Um, elegance or irrelevance of these other attributes are much more difficult to, uh, to capture. Okay. So we can see that some elements which would take a lot of words to describe something like fear or desperation 
uh, the look on a person's face is probably the best way to depict that. So in these contexts, we, de we can very much see that a picture can be deeply um, illuminating. Um, one of the, uh, the sets of challenges is when you're designing a communications to an audience, uh, you don't want to get too far ahead of the audience being too, too clever. You obviously want to engage people with something that's fresh. If something's tired, cliched, boring, you're not obviously going to get the same level of audience engagement, but you can go a little bit too far. Um, and particularly this problem of openness of interpretation. So we'll, we'll see always this uh, is a dilemma. I think that helps to explain why there is so much falling back on what works, not just because David Ogilvy said that that's actually quite a clever thing to do, um, if it really does work, but that it also it takes a certain confidence in a sense to go off script uh, in communication design, because if you get it wrong, and particularly if it's a very expensive campaign, then that's very, very risky for, for companies, potentially very, very costly. So we often see that when we're using relatively open images, we tend to anchor them with uh, some kind of textual cue as well, which was mentioned in the, uh, the previous set of uh, slides here. So one of the interesting questions too, is if you, if you have something that's a bit riddle-like, that if people have to work to make sense of it, some people won't and you lose them. But on the other hand, if people too do make an effort to engage with the message, then they're far more likely to actually remember that interaction with the brand communication. Because whenever you have to work harder at it, uh, you are more likely to remember what you do. By the way, very interesting studies have been done with students. When you give handouts to students, um, say copies of, of lecture notes, where literally what they, the researchers have done is they've blurred the copy somewhat. They've made it a messy copy rather than a clean copy. And where the students had to actually kind of work quite hard to see what the copy was saying. Often they had to add extra notes where maybe it looked like some text was obscured that was actually deliberate in the research. Then they tested the students on the content and found that actually those students that had the messier copies actually had higher levels of recall because literally you had to work harder at it. So this is, this is a little bit hint of a hint of potential problems, not just with online education, but as we move to very high resolution where we can get everything on nice 5K screens, for example, on our iPads, um, we literally work less hard at it and therefore we're less likely to recall it uh, subsequently. I don't suggest you actually kind of get drunk to the point of having blurred vision um, and then reading your lecture notes because, of course, alcohol impairs memory in a whole range of other ways. Okay. Um, also, in terms of this interpretation diversity, we find that even closed ads, people actually take various meanings from it as well. So the, uh, the risk of interpretation diversity doesn't arise just simply from having, for example, open images. Finally, we have to keep in mind that um, it's not about making beautiful things from a corporate communications perspective. Uh, it's really about audience comprehension, audience engagement, engagement of course, um, and audience comprehension. So that's the criteria for judging whether something is good in terms of corporate communications or not. So I'll stop that there and then I will turn to our next set of slides. And Bear with me a moment. I've opened them all up, uh, but my desktop is quite a mess. As a consequence, here we go. Okay, so this is a little bit of a forced march, I'm afraid. I'm going to zoom rather too quickly through this, but I want to emphasize just several, several key points from this very brief overview of visual communications theory. Um, in particular, I'm actually presenting earlier theory, which has now been superseded, and indeed much of the research on visual communications um, has been superseded by huge advances in uh, brain science, in uh, effectively looking at cognition through the mechanisms of how the brain works and being able to stick people in um, 
big scanners and whatnot, MRIs and, and see what's actually happening in terms of how the brain works um, through perception. Nonetheless, we still get some interesting hints for communication design from some of the early theory, even when it was actually criticized by, uh, by scientists. Um, Aldous Huxley, the very famous author of the, uh, the book Brave New World and many other things, he was a, a huge influential thinker, novelist, um, writer in general. Um, he's near blind, actually. He really struggled to read. So uh, kind of a remarkable case of overcoming um, a huge in, initial disability to deeply engage with the power of words of text and to write. Um, his formula of sensing plus selecting and then perceiving equals seeing was, a, was an interesting one. And we can think of this because he suffered a degree of visual impairments. You know, he would, I guess, what uh, we more directly and immediately perceive, he was very, in his case, he was very aware that there was something out there that he that he should engage with so he he would in some broad sense select that there was the you know sense that there was something to see um he would then focus in on it he would then perceive it more precisely and then that for him was seeing so i think we should take seriously this formulation precisely because it grew out of his own experience of near blindness but in some sense too we can map this onto the experience of information overload or you know attention overload in our contemporary digital era where we have so many devices on the go um, simultaneously so many people trying to communicate to us um, in dense urban spaces such as tokyo we are constantly bombarded of course uh, by uh, so much uh, rich visuality people trying to sell us stuff trying to get our attention um, just navigating obviously a subway system with 20 or 30 exits and all the advertising. And if you go through Idabashi, for example, where JR trying to monetize the movement of people through, no, sorry, the Metro, my apologies. So there to JR, but there is a bad, um, the Metro trying to monetize the, uh, the movement of so many eyeballs through their spaces there. You may have noticed if you come out of the Torzai line and then you're heading towards Numbok Sen or you're heading up to JR, for example, they've now stuck huge digital, um, billboards around all of the posters, which means that people are constantly running, running into each other because the net effect is that the, uh, the pillars have become um, so much broader and also people are more distracted. So in some sense, the, we know that there is so much happening out there. Uh, we then select something to look more closely at, to engage with, and, and, and then we go through this process of seeing. So I think we can take a hint um, from Huxley, even if, uh, his account, which initially thought would be backed up by science, um, looks a little bit shaky in terms of literally how uh, the, uh, the mechanisms, the bodily mechanisms of viewing occurs. Now, Gestalt theory was hugely influential, as the name suggests, of course, um, primarily was developed in Germany, particularly influential from the 1920s. As an overall theory of cognition, it's been very much sub sub uh, sub superseded by subsequent research. But still, um, many of the, the visual tricks you can see in, in, in books that are constantly shared through social media, for example, uh, go back to, in fact, they very often literally of um, the images taken from books from Gestalt theory. So I just picked off just, just a few examples here and some basic concepts. Um, as I, uh, I'll read off the notes here and then, and then we'll see the particular example of how this works. Objects are perceived as a whole, not as parts that are mentally assembled. And therefore the whole is more than the sum of the parts perceptually. This is the notion of the emergence property. And we'll see a simple example of this. Um, our eye actually completes um, fragments, okay? So we, we see things sometimes as cohering as a whole when they're not. And that, that's how some of these visual tricks that are done to, to demonstrate uh, this effect. Very often also the brain infers the presence of certain forms through partial, partial shapes. This is reification. And if you simply want to test yourself on this, uh, take any row of text and cover two thirds of the, of the text. So we don't actually, when we're reading, say any, any Roman scripts, you know, such as English or German or French or whatever, we don't actually see individual letters. 
Uh, they're there if we want to, of course, and kids, when they're spelling things out, um, you know, do do that. Uh, but what we actually typically see is our eye sees the top of the letters. So they really, they discern words and actually clusters of words simply with the rising and falling. This is why when someone decides to all cap something, if you see something in block letters, all capped, it is so excruciatingly difficult to read because in fact, we're not picking out words uh, as assemblage of letters. We're actually looking literally at the rise and the fall. And just actually messing with caps can really slow down reading. So if you were to capitalize um, every word in a regular sentence, you would find that it takes so much longer to read. And so you can, you can experiment um, yourself. In fact, if you've got a piece of paper, you can, you can even put it over your screen right now and see how far can you go. You can, you can often get up to at least to cover two thirds of the letters in a sentence and still be able to make out what it says quite effectively. So to, um, as an extension of oh, rolling back and forth, I'll make you see sick as an extension of this um, emergence property. If we look to the, uh, the middle point here, dot point with guest, um, gestalt psychology. Um, also, we have a very strong orientation towards symmetry that um, if you were to look at, we say, say here, the law of symmetry says the mind perceives objects as symmetrically organized around a central point. Our brains have absolutely no problems bracketing those uh, different brackets together, quite literally, the whole notion of bracketing, okay? Brackets work because we look for the symmetry. Now, you could arguably see this as within the square brackets, then something that looks like a K and something that looks like a reverse K, but we don't. We tend to bracket the similar together, okay? And rather than actually bracket things together that are closer, if you can see what's here. So your mind mentally is bracketing together the similar, um, looking for this symmetry, rather than bracketing things together based on pure proximity. So many of the interesting visual tricks that uh, we, we see in communication design came about from so much of the experimentation done amongst um, Gestalt psychologists, particularly in Germany in the interwar period. I'm gonna do profound injustice to semiotics. Really, this is just a way of telling you about the field that's out there, okay? Um, so it's just alerting you to a very, very rich field, which some of you may be interested in pursuing later on. Uh, some of you may have come, have come across semiotics, semiotic approaches, um, if, if you've been studying linguistics, for example, so it might be quite familiar. Um, so effectively, what semiotics does is, as I say here, it thinks of language as systems of signs, okay? Of course, no accident that uh, semiotics was given a huge boost by increasing interest in non-European languages, particularly the ideographic uh, languages associated with kanji. And so we do see that some um, semioticians, someone like Roland Barthes, for example, he came on a sabbatical to Japan and he wrote a whole book about um, experiencing Japan through kanji, even though he couldn't actually read kanji. So he just simply saw kanji as, as, as effectively a series of signs. It was quite a contentious book and there's some very illuminating things, some things he gets wrong. Um, but it's, it's kanji, a world of kanji viewed through the eyes of someone who couldn't actually read kanji, which is a quite interesting thing, okay? Um, but this semiotic approach effectively says that we see the world through, through signs. And signs evoke various meanings. We make sense of these signs. Um, and of course, we see very often foreign languages being used for literally as a, as a visual prop. It helps to explain how even if you don't speak a word of Japanese and you're fairly recent to Japan, you nonetheless can become familiar with certain kanji just as visual prompts. Just like you, you might read a kanji in the same way that you might read an arrow, for example, okay, without being deeply uh, acculturated or educated into the full meaning, the let alone the pronunciation of it. Um, my father told me, by the way, that um, 
he used to drink with this old bloke when he was a, he was a young school teacher in a small town. He used to drink with this old bloke um, who had never been overseas, but was um, studying Chinese to a very high level. He didn't speak a single word of Chinese, but he became hugely interested in kanji because he used to um, work as a removalist, literally, or uh, and I remember this as a kid, that actually in the past, tea used to come in these packing cases, these tea chests. And this was how the tea was shipped from China, huge tea chests. And then they were re reused um, for packing things up and moving. It also meant when you moved house that your stuff ended up smelling of tea. And the uh, tea chests had lots of kanji on them. And this guy spent all day, every day moving boxes and he got hugely interested in kanji. And um, so he actually studied Chinese as a hobby, even though he never had in a small town native speak to actually tell him how to, to um, pronounce the language. And if you think about this in the past, when we were completely dependent on the written text, as a way of acquiring knowledge, but we didn't have access to a speaker of that language. This is remarkably how it would have been if people in the Edo period, for example, were learning, learning medical knowledge um, or military knowledge through Dutch learning, uh, through Dutch texts that came through Dejima and Nagasaki, not having anyone to actually tell you how to pronounce the words, but to simply see the text as a cipher or as a code or as a sign or a symbol, which you then mapped onto your own system of meaning. Some of the uh, the early pioneers, Pierce, um, who's also was very influential political science as well with his whole theory of pragmatism and de Saussure, um, all of these provide early foundations that actually very much built on philosophy. This is why you see people who could simultaneously be political philosophers and actually look at semiotics as well too. A lot of Western philosophy uh, tries to get at um, issues of being, ontological issues, through perception and trying to tie the whole notion of, of existence through being a uh, perceiving um, and a meta-perceiving creature. Um, pragmatics, you, if you've studied linguistics, you may have come across the discussion of pragmatics in this particular context, the relationship between signs and their users. Um, I just want to briefly mention Umberto Eco, a hugely interesting character. He was an academic uh, before he became a novelist, very famous for the, uh, the, uh, the novel, The Name of the Rose, and it's a brilliant film as well. Um, I actually saw him present completely by chance once, um, my first time ever in Paris. Uh, fell into a com so it's the, the benefits of speaking to a complete stranger. I was, I was sitting on a freezing cold bench um, in Paris in December and some guy spoke to me and we fell into a chat and he said, I'm about to go and see Umberto Eco give a lecture. Do you want to come along? I said, yeah, fantastic. Okay. Um, so Umberto Eco present French, <laughs> which is quite interesting and uh, encouraged me to, to keep learning the language. Um, Umberto Eco is a very famous Italian semiotic uh, theorist and then he uh, brought his uh, his works because Pendulum, for example, is another influential um, work very much um, inspired by his understanding of the role of language as a, as a system of signs. Roland Barthes, perhaps the uh, the most renowned scholar of semiotics, and I've also mentioned him in the context of, of course, the uh, the book in Japan, but also very famous in relation to photography. He's the one who wrote a, a book about the status of the photograph, um, being inspired. Uh, by his very strong emotional reaction to seeing a picture of his mother after she had uh, passed away. So these are some of the big names. Uh, we're not doing justice, of course, to their work, but just simply flagging that this is a very significant um, field of ongoing research. And um, it's a very hot field these days too, semiotics and using semiotic insights um, in terms of branding. So some friends of mine who run a branding consultancy, um, several of them German, one of them half German, half English, studied semiotics at uh, Cambridge. And so they very much see a role for adding um, a very rigorous qualitative approach to branding communications that's um, in, in 
to, to complement the big data statistics driven kind of approaches that we're seeing. And of course they're coming closer and closer together too, with things like eye tracking and uh, the ability to just simply look at data on click through rates and whatnot, we can get a sense of what kind of images um, work more effectively. And I'll say something about this in a moment in relation to um, testing communication images. So let's turn next to the discussion of uh, color. Um, and you might remember we kicked off last class. I, uh, whoops, yeah, screen sharing. If I can just find what I'm screen sharing to you. Okay. I asked you last class about how many of you have done some basic color theory. So when we say color by design, this means obviously very consciously choosing to put combinations of colors together uh, for effect obviously for aesthetic effect, but particularly for engagement reasons. And um, particularly that in terms of, of seeing, of getting people to engage, to look more carefully, um, we need to have a very strong understanding of contrast. And contrast, and the significance of contrast is often obscured when people are using color. Now, my father was various things. My father's a high school teacher, but he was also a photographer. and, um, and two separate occasions he in my life when I was growing up he actually had a photography studio in fact my father at one point held the record for the number of times he had quit the Queensland Education Department um, several times to uh, to go and be a photographer instead and for various reasons he kind of went back to teaching and doing the photography um, on, on the side so I grew up always with a dark room in the house we always did the uh, the black and white work was always done in-house, color was always outsourced because uh, with film, photography, color, uh, the machines, if you're doing it at a larger scale, are hugely expensive. If you're doing it smaller scale, um, extraordinarily difficult to um, really just keep your colors right because with chemical-based photography, you really needed to be doing it relatively large scale. So typically what photographers did was they outsourced the development of color film and color printing uh, to laboratories and kept a black and white in house. So I kind of grew up literally as a little, from, from as young as I can remember with the, uh, the smell of chemicals and being in the dark room, which is a really um, novel thing for most people. It also means I have absolutely no fear whatsoever of the, uh, of the dark. One thing my father used to emphasize to me was that um, everyone who wanted to work um, or just wanted to, to take good photographs, wanted to work in photography, should start off doing black and white. And I don't know if that's still the case in photography programs, but this was always the case in uh, art schools, university photography programs, because if you start with black and white, you learn to see light. You, you see the full richness of light, how light falls on surfaces, and you get a particularly strong sense of contrast. Okay, and so many people when they first started taking photographs, they fall into the trap of um, not being alert to contrast. Now today, if you were to take a picture outside and I'm looking outside my window, everything is incredibly flat, okay? Just no contrast, everything is shades of gray. And so traditionally photographers actually use a whole range of filters and they use very specific films and, and papers that they print onto that accentuate the contrast. But on a day like today, black and white, just horrible. All you can do is very consciously decide to pay, take pictures which make a feature of a lack of contrast. However, on the other hand, the lack of contrast is fantastic um, when you're taking photographs of people. So my experience when I was doing wedding photography, so many people like to get married um, in spring or early fall. In Australia, the light is so incredibly harsh. And so I was always really, really grateful for an, for an overcast day. And uh, so I we would always use a whole range of things like diffusers and whatnot, which have the effect of trying to overcome the really, the really harsh light. Um, this also, though, is why uh, in winter the light is so incredibly beautiful. It's a little bit softer, but it tends to be much more oblique. It's hitting at an angle. 
And so you get wonderful shadow effects and whatnot, which is terrible if you're trying to take photographs of people, you've got a big nose and like a shadow, I've got a very big nose. Um, so you've got shadows all over the place. Uh, but if you're taking landscape pictures or things like that, it's very effective. Okay, basic color theory, you've all got this. I'm not gonna to talk too much of this because obviously you can, you can look at it yourselves. Um, this is the classic color wheel. Um, it's not just pretty, it gives us very powerful clues on uh, what colors go well together. Now, good designers do not get bound by this. Okay, and my son doing graphic design uh, says that uh, his professors or instructors are always emphasizing um, don't be don't be afraid to go off the uh, the color wheel okay uh, do do interesting things um, have confidence in it um, but what you can see is some of those things which instinctively seem to go together pretty well um, you probably well we all have very much internalized a sense of what goes together well and what doesn't because all around us people are kind of following the logic of the color wheel so we are deeply acculturated to this without even realizing it um but whether it's whether it's acculturation whether there is something fundamental to the way we perceive this is what the uh, the brain scientists are, are still trying to answer but um purple and yellow do look really really good together okay um you can see that um, shades of blue and orange look very, very good together. Okay. Now, first of all, the contrast. Uh, if you look to the uh, the left, those colors look alright together. Um, till you actually turn them into black and white and very, very low contrast. Okay. Now, why does contrast actually matter? Well, here's a fundamental thing. Um, we as human beings are very alert to the outlines of things. Um, now, whether this was because the, um, maybe the, the beasts of, of prey, those animals that would attack us, the, uh, the, the lions or tigers or whatever, um, might be hiding just behind a tree. We really want to be able to distinguish between the line of the tree and, and the enemy, um, or the animal that's likely to savage us. Um, maybe that's a factor there. Um, but we are very alert to the points of contrast. Uh, we navigate the world to a significant degree through navigating the outlines of things. Um, this that there are lots of hints in this when you when you understand this that people often overlook if you're going to do a really 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 bad job painting a wall for example if you're getting really tired and sick of painting and by the way i love painting um i find a therapy uh but also unlike academic work i can immediately see the benefits of what i've done in fact uh, i i renovated several houses and apartments and it's, it's often academics seem to like to do this thing because you like to do things with their hands when we normally do things with our brains and writing and whatnot. And uh, several colleagues of mine have done this similarly. And we've always, this, always had this conversation. Painting a house is exactly the opposite of academic work. All the annoying stuff is in the upfront preparation, the surface preparation, the getting the old paint off, the sanding and everything. Painting finishes on a high note because the paint goes on, you step back and it looks really, really good. In contrast, academic work, you start with great enthusiasm, you've got a new idea and it becomes more and more tedious as you have to write the thing. And then as I've been experiencing the last few weeks, um, sub-editors, editors keep coming back to check on reference details and whatnot and the thing never seems to be done. But the big hint here is if you are painting, um, it's the edges that matter. If you're gonna be lazy, you be lazy in the middle of the wall. People will not see it. It's out at the edges that really make a difference. So actually in defining the edge, if you find yourself running out of paint, the worst thing you can do is paint on the nice thick color in the middle and run out on the edges. People are gonna notice, okay? Much, much better to paint the edges. And if you're running a little bit thin, uh, to end up effectively a tint. A tint, by the way, is when you add white, okay? A shade is when you add black, and a tone is when you add gray. That's the, I'm not gonna test you on that, but that's the, uh, that's the uh, distinction there. So it's much better for the paint to go thin in the middle of the wall rather than the edges. Um, and so many 
people who really suck at painting can't do the cutting in, can't get the neat edges. You really need to be patient. You really need to learn that skill because by drawing that nice edge um, helps to define the space. Okay. So there is a practice that skill. Okay. That's also why we see in so many color schemes where you do a contrast with the door frames, for example, uh, with just a contrasting color that it's not just that it's a border, um, but we tend to see at the, uh, the point of the contrast. And also instinctively, the human eye is drawn to the point of the contrast, okay? Which means that if you've got a really important message that you want to get across to people, um, people's eyes will be drawn to the point of the contrast. So if you were to lay out a text, I wish I should have loaded an example, but if you've got the important catch copy over on the left, but to the right, you know, the, see the dark blue hits a nice contrast um, with a light yellow, people's eyes are going to be drawn in the opposite direction. So you want to go for high contrast. Um, in, in a sense, this is like that, that, that old English expression or gag, and now for something completely different, to actually draw a contrast will actually bring attention. This is something we're going to come to. Now, Key thing with the color wheel, opposites complement. We saw before, um, I mentioned purple and yellow, um, blue and orange, and green and red. Now, they complement very nicely. Um, of course, when we think from a semiotic perspective, they are deeply imbued with the meaning of Christmas. So if you put your red shirt on, with your green trousers and you go to the pub, you can expect someone at least in Australia to go, ho, 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 Merry Christmas and make you feel like a complete turkey, okay? So unfortunately, those late 19th, early 20th century Christmas card designers and whatnot um, have a lot to answer for and no one can put green and red together except for Christmas. Um, if you wanna get a little bit more sophisticated, use split complementary, okay? As you can see there, and that of course is a good way of overcoming the, uh, the Christmas effect. Um, as a general rule for a house, a three color scheme is a pretty good thing to do. For the, That's for the outside of the house. Anything more than that, it starts to get a little bit too busy. Um, but you can play with tones in interesting ways. Um, two other things we need to know here, of course, and um, you can go to the original source of these sites to get more detail. Um, analogous colors are near each other on the color wheel. So if you want to introduce greater complexity, you use analogous colors and then add a contrasting color. Um, monochromatic schemes, uh, you see a lot of them these days, actually. Monochromatic scheme takes one color, so it's a basic hue, H-U-E, a hue, which is a, a pure color, and then tints, shades, tones. And as I said, a tint adds white, okay? A shade adds black, and a tone adds gray. Now, someone's immediately probably thinking, hang on, isn't, isn't um, gray a mixture of white and black? Yes, it is, okay? So, of course, um, you can get to a tone by putting white and black in, of course, or if you've got a premixed gray, you can add it in. Uh, that also gives us a clue that, of course, white, black, gray is neutral, so that if you want to introduce uh, greater complexity, richness, into a scheme without pe doing people's heads in visually, a very good way to do this, of course, is to set against um, a range of tones. So from light gray through to uh, dark gray, for example, and then to anchor it on um, one hue. Uh, you can get into more sophisticated, uh, more com complicated schemes as uh, we see here. Okay. Now, very briefly to, to zoom through this, um, we are not kind of randomly walking through the world with this infinite, near infinite array of colors that there are several major taste makers out there. Pantone is the most famous. Of course, it leads color trends, literally. It announces every year the color of the year. Normally with about a one to two year lag, you will see this turning up in fast fashion. And I've got some examples here. This is this year. This was picked, of course, before COVID-19, classic blue. I, I, if they picked it in March rather than um, November last year, 
uh, I wonder what they would have picked. That would be an uh, interesting question. It's actually really quite a beautiful blue, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a dramatic thing, Pantone. Um, they hold huge launch events and so many people want to get invited to these. Um, this is one here, This uh, someone from CNN was invited. So they had blue cocktails. They had a graphic artist who was using the color of, uh, digital artist to use the color of the year, for example. 2019, very nice color. Um, you can still see this if you go to fast fashion and particularly the uh, the discount box okay there's a hell of a lot of stuff in living coral okay um in a in a derivative kind of way but of course it's a nice color so it's a bit on trend but it's so last year in a pantone sense but uh, with the lag it's very much on trend this year so you go you'll see a lot of this color um, in summer, okay? Typically Pantone, what they do is when they launch the color, they use a whole range of visual, visuals to communicate this. Um, I just can't imagine some poor intern um, going to every pet shop in New York until they found a fish that actually looked that color, I, I, um, as in a Devil Wears Prada kind of moment that, you know, it's gotta be living coral and searching everywhere to find the poor fish that color. Um, then the descriptions and you can read this. And of course, a lot of people like to take the piss out of this because it uh, sometimes looks um, kind of over overstated. Okay. Um, and you can engage with it yourselves. Okay. Uh, so when uh, I was preparing this, I thought, well, um, this is well advanced last year. I thought, oh, well, better start looking what fast fashion is kind of doing this and you can see tones of it. They don't want to be seen to be too derivative. So they literally will play with the tones. They will darken it and lighten it and whatnot, but they're not going to get too far away from the um, on color um, trends. Okay. Uh, Gap of course, didn't hesitate to, as you can see the uh, there's, there's pretty cool baggy trousers. I love women in baggy trousers <laughs> myself. Um, just so practical take on the world. Um, these here. Uh, you can see that they are straight living coral a la Pantone. But uh, some of the fast fashion outfits themselves, they, they want to be a little bit more edgy. So they try and actually nudge color preferences in other directions as well, particularly towards proprietary colors that they've um, had uh, developed them, themselves uh, with fabric makers and whatnot. So we see Banana Republic on the one hand will do some stuff that's quite derivative, very much influenced by Pantone. Again, the one at the list is, list is at the left is very much just um, uh, tinted um, coral, as we saw. Okay, um, past colors of the year, you can see these here. You can look at them, um, and there's normally you know grand statements you know about the logic here. So this particular one, eighteen. We're living in a time that requires inventiveness and imagination. Okay. It's this kind of creative inspiration. that is indigenous to Pantone, blah, blah, blah. The particular color, ultraviolet, a blue based purple that takes our awareness and potential to a higher level. Okay. From exploring new technologies and the greater galaxy to artistic expression and spiritual reflection, um, intuitive ultraviolet lights the way to what is yet to come. Isn't that wonderfully inspiring? Um, Although I do remember the uh, second day in my academic career, I spoke with a new colleague who was a bit weird. And then I um, then spoke to another new colleague and said, I just met this particular professor. It was an interesting conversation to which he looked at me and said, mm, I think Professor McGovern has some good drugs he's not sharing, which always kind of stuck in my mind. So maybe to get that, yeah. Maybe you need to have some chemicals which are illegal in Japan and therefore you must not consume. Okay. Uh, so we can see uh, that Pantone builds a whole elaborate communicative ecology, literally in terms of its visuality around the launch of these different colors. This one, interestingly, a few years ago was that actually brought out two colors together because of uh, their complementarity. It's a very nice color scheme. And you can still see this used in a whole range of color schematics rose quartz and serenity uh by the way if you've ever um been involved in painting uh, a property and got color charts uh it is an art form in its own right actually naming all these different colors so just simply coming up with new creative names 
Now, there is an organization called the Color Association of the United States. It's an industry association, but they actually have their own consulting services and whatnot as well, too. So they will do uh, research for clients in terms of color trends. And some of it's actually brain science driven stuff. A lot of it is actually looking about um, influence of emerging artists, for example, on visual culture. Okay, now we can see that, as I, as I mentioned, Banana Republic, for example, um, they try to influence the color trends themselves. So this is one where they, they say color forecast, but they, it's, it's not a color forecast. They're actually trying to create the buzz um, themselves. So they will have their own designers looking for new sources of influence. Okay, so bring the heat of summer with paprika, saffron, smuck, and more fiery shades. Now, Samak is actually much more purple. Um, so that's, yeah, which is a, a wonderful thing with olive oil. And you get in the Middle East all the time. Now, very importantly with color schemes, um, in this digital era, you can actually test them quite simply. So you actually do your graphic design, and then uh, you can use a meta software and actually change the color schemes and then have audience views and use eye tracking and whatnot to actually figure out which ones work better. Um, one of the interesting kind of hints just down here, if you're wondering about if you, if you live by the number of likes you get on Facebook, for example, um, Facebook is blue dominant unless people change their own settings. And of course, now that you I looked at it for the first time in months, I've noticed I've just given you a new interface and whatnot. Um, you want to go for complementary colors, looking for the contrast. Okay. So if you're really after those shares um, and assuming people have still got the old blue background for Facebook and you put up similar things with lots of colors, it'll blend in. People simply won't see it. Okay. So go for the contrast. So I'll stop the share there. Um, and uh, we'll line up the next content I want to speak to. Ah, before we do that, uh, let's go back to the website. Got a couple of things I want to share here in terms of color. Okay. Um, come back to data visualization. Uh, first of all, those of you who know the singer Prince, he passed away um, back in 2016. The magazine The New Yorker, um, uh, it, uh, to memorialize him, simply had this cover. And of course, anyone who knew Prince's music immediately knew this for his very famous song, Purple Rain. And this became a huge collector's item, this cover, as you can well imagine, sold out. Um, Everyone who loved the singer wanted to have that. Okay. Um, now this is not color per se, but the uh, a, po uh, a potent image, um, uh, Harley Davidson, uh, very clever image with very clever bit of copy with it. Um, Harley spirit, you're born with it. Kind of nostalgia meets surrealism in interesting quirky kind of way. Okay, um, so just give some sense of, you know, kind of on-trend uh, uh, use of color in digital uh, content production. And of course that carries over so much into what we're seeing in terms of uh, graphic design and whatnot for commercial, more commercial purposes. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to next content. Okay, bear with me just a moment. And this is kind of color and emotion. Uh, I think we all understand how color can impact on our emotional states. So just go off to here. First of all, of course, um, a combination of form and color can take on very specific meanings. Uh, this is the Australian War Memorial. And if you're visiting there, and you want to engage in a mark, in a gesture of remembrance, maybe for uh, an ancestor who passed away, uh, you can buy a red poppy. And of course the poppies are a flower which bloom wild in the fields of Northern France and Belgium, the, where the battlefields were of World War I. And it was one of the very indelible images for, um, people, family members, French, German, English in particular, um, who visited the battlefields 
after World War I, quite a lot of people went uh, to visit the grave or the battlefield itself uh, to memorialize lost, lost ones. Remember, six million people died in, in, in that conflict. It's just, just you know, in, incomprehensible slaughter. Um, of course, many people made the, uh, the journey in the spring and the summer um, to the fields of Flanders, northern France. And um, many of these flowers were, were blooming at the time when they visited. So a lot of people picked the poppies and then placed them on the graves. And then they became a visual representation of memorialization, which a century on, far away in this Australian continent, um, in Australian War Memorial, the poppies are still meaningful. And, you know, if you, for example, lost a family member, uh, even in um, Australia's recent haphazard military involvements in, say, Afghanistan and whatnot with the Americans, um, that it's a, an appropriate gesture to put a, a red poppy um, next to the person's name. So colour preferences, that said, um, for the most part, when we, when we think of red and yellow and, we, and we're looking at the universality in association with emotional states, no surprise, think of McDonald's, okay? Red and yellow tend to be associated with appetite. Uh, it's a brave person who starts a hamburger joint and goes for a colour scheme that's all green and blue, okay? Uh, blue and green are generally considered to be appetite uh, suppressants. So maybe if you uh, want to go on a diet, you paint your dining room green, maybe, maybe one approach, I don't know. Um, so we see that actually in so many countries, maybe partly imitative of McDonald's, but partly because it seems to work, uh, that if you go for yellow or red color schemes, if you look at Jollibee, for example, for the Philippines and so many other places, um, you can see that this is very common. Um, as a generalization, Cooler colours such as blues and greens tend to get more favourable reactions used in, in corporate contexts where you're trying to promote trust. Particularly blue seems to be very strongly associated with authority and trust is very significant. Also wealth here. Um, there's a metaphor, of course, the blue bloods for um, elites. Blue associated with security. This has always been a problem for parties on the left everywhere. Um, the Labour Party in Australia, New Zealand, uh, the UK, for example, have always been associated with red. Uh, in my country, the more conservative party called the Liberal Party, although they're often not as liberal, even though they've got liberal in the name, um, they are perfectly positioned colour-wise because they have this royal blue colour, no surprising, historically they were monarchists as well, okay? Um, and so we often see parties, more conservative parties, being associated with, uh, with blue, um, as a, you know, providing assurance, for example. Um, a dark, a very dark blue suit can communicate a similar kind of effect or a blue, very dark blue sports jacket, for example. People often shy off um, having anything other than uh, gray or black, but very, it's been shown very, very, very dark navy suit or is often give you um, a greater sense of, of looking relaxed, but also authoritative, okay? Um, orange under some conditions associated with cheapness, um, although I might be slightly disconcerted because you may have noticed that across all my courses this semester, I've gone for this um, burnt orange, um, as my kind of theme color for the semester. Um, although I did just um, recently hear that um, Hugh Hefner, uh, founder of Playboy magazine, his favorite color was bird orange. So I'm not, <laughs> not necessarily inspired by Hugh Hefner, although he was a brilliant, brilliant of business, okay? Um, orange tends in a positive vein to be associated with a fireplace and whatnot. So there is something very nice about it. Uh, of course, you know, we were all cavemen and women once upon a time, the discovery of fire was obviously transformative and uh, still, you know, that smell of burning wood, as long as it's not your house, <laughs> in your house, the fireplace and whatnot, still evokes deeply something psychologically in a very positive way, in a comforting way and seeing the colors of an open fire that you know, we are sort of hardwired to draw comfort um, from that. Green has a positive association with freshness, we understand, but certain tones of green can also be, more blue greens, for example, can be associated with mold, with rot. Um, although if you've got pink on your, on your lettuce and whatnot, you really wanna be worried about pink. And so the thing is, it's actually a very nice pink, but it's like, mm, 
don't eat that. Okay, um, you've got these, uh, you can look at these more carefully yourselves, the particular associations with colors, but courage and bravery, for example, not surprise red and the surprisingly red and purple. Um, red, very strongly associated with speed, 76%. Um, uh, the red Ferrari, most countries, this association is very strong. Japan is a very unusual sports car market. Um, it's changed somewhat, but the best selling color in sports cars for many years in Japan was actually yellow. And um, unfortunately for people who bought a yellow sports car in Japan, um, the resale values are much, much lower than a red sports car for the very, particularly if it's a Ferrari, for example because there's a huge business in re-exporting European, particularly Italian sports cars to other markets. But uh, it's very difficult to sell a yellow sports car to foreigners. By the way, when I see these yellow um, produced in these pie charts, they just look like slices of craft um, processed cheese to me, um, which I don't like. I'm a very good lover of good stinky French cheeses myself. Um, Oh, cheeses from anywhere. Okay, color and emotion in general. Okay, uh, there, are, there are attempts to try and figure out whether we're hardwired to some of these kinds of associations and hypotheses about evolutionary origins, um, associations of, of blue, for example, with a clear, clean, fresh water supply um, seem to be quite significant. And uh, lots of studies have been done of reactions to websites because it's quite easy to control because you can actually then try exactly the same design of the website with different color schemes and get um, audience uh, reactions. You can literally wire people up and see how their pulse rate changes and things like that. Okay. Um, so these, these are Pantone color schemes here you can see and color emotion, uh, um, emotion and color associations and you can look uh, more carefully at them. Red, not surprising, love, passion, energy, power, strength, heat, and desire. Okay. Um, blue, tranquility, security, integrity, peace, loyalty, trust, and intelligence. Green, fresh environment, new money. I'm not quite sure where that comes from. Fertility, healing, the earth, and whatnot. Um, but they're also cultural specific associations. I know I've got a couple of students from, from France today. I remember a French student telling me once when I was wearing a green tie that he said he liked it, but his father had told him never to wear a green tie to a business meeting, but he couldn't remember the reason why. And for 10 years, it stuck in my mind. Uh, every time I do put on a green tie, am I, am I uh, going to be uh, disconcerting some French folks? I don't know. Um, it may have been his father's own very particular take on it. Um, the color emotion guide and looking to various brands, we can, we can see here that if there is a very clear association with colors and an emotional reaction, then of course certain brands are going to, uh, to benefit from that. There does seem to be a lot of widespread understanding here. If we look at certain brands uh, that they want to wrap themselves, of course, in um, the emotions associated with certain colors. Um, Arguably, we, there's a cynical element here. We see BP, of course, trying to make themselves, you know, British Petroleum, trying to make themselves look very, very green. Um, that has been an interesting effect that uh, more and more companies associated with very not green industries are, are trying to maybe distract uh, people's attention by wrapping themselves in green color schemes. Now, this issue of cultural difference in relation to color schemes is significant with companies, whether they have to be at the cost of localization or not. Um, if you have bought uh, a product that clothing product, for example, or bought anything from Ikea or whatever, you realize just the sheer challenges of meeting, meeting the labeling requirements for the EU, you know, where you get every European language and you, you get this, you know, the first thing you can do before you can wear the shirt is you actually hack, have to hack off this label that's about this long, that's all written in four point font in and half a dozen different, well, a dozen different languages um, for things sold in the European um, market. That in itself is a challenge, just those basic labeling requirements. Then if you've actually got all of these problems of cultural difference in relation to color schemes, that's where it gets difficult. We do know generally in Japan, gold doesn't sell, uh, gold color things don't sell very well in contrast, say in China. I remember when I first bought my um, MacBook, the compact one, I went to, uh, to buy it and you couldn't get stock um, 
anywhere. Uh, it was quite popular um, for a couple of weeks. And they'd, they'd said, um, if you if you can wait two weeks, we'll get the silver in. I got the I got the silver one. But if you want the gold one, you're going to have to wait six weeks. And I said, no, I don't think I need the gold one. I don't want the gold one. I said, really? It takes longer. What? Because it's not so popular. And I said, no, no, no. It's far and away the most popular because there was a huge Bakugai effect. The product hadn't yet been released in China. And uh, lots of people were buying lots of them up, the gold colored one, uh, to give as, well, to, to, to resell into the China market. But particularly, it was considered, you know, Engi and uh, something, a good color to give as a present. And of course, the association of gold and red for like kotobuki for in a, in a celebratory sense is very, very strong in the, in the Chinese cultural context and relatively less so in the Japanese case. Anyway, research shows, as, the, as my slides show there, that actually there are universal elements and there are highly localized elements as well. And you can look more carefully at this yourselves. It's, it's a bit difficult to kind of point to and uh, um, navigate here virtually. So have a look at that. Um, you can see this just in differences in airlines. Um, this was in Turkish Turkish Airlines. I got on with a, um, an Australian friend. We were both going uh, to a conference and we we're going via Istanbul. And my, my friend got on in a color scheme. He says, this looks like a nightclub. I, want to, I don't want to admit I've been in, okay? Uh, I did subsequently hear that um, Turkish Airlines had done research and they found that the color scheme was supposed to be quite calming. Uh, so there's a debate about whether it was more because they're very significant in terms of the Middle Eastern market or whether the color scheme was 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 calming. But I don't know. I uh, I felt like it actually was in a club run by Hugh Hefner of the Playboy Playboy Club or something anyway. So uh, what we need to keep in mind, though, is it's not just about the color, um, particularly in terms of packaging and whatnot, that actually very often it's the patina, um, whether it's a sheen or not. OK. Uh, very significant differences on this, particularly as uh, the uh, shift towards sustainability and recycling, we're becoming much more familiar with uh, materiality of the recycled product, the recycled paper. And indeed, there is this interesting question, if it's recycled paper, it also has to look like recycled paper. That if it's too glossy, people don't believe it's actually recycled as well. So also something on a little, people want things a little bit more kind of artisanal. Uh, they want things more matte, for example. Um, you know, gloss house painting is pretty off trend these days, unless you're picking out a particular surface as a feature. So people want matte or semi-matte. And that actually drove me crazy when I was painting my Niigata apartment. I'd find all these colors that I wanted to buy um, in paint shops in Japan, and they only sold them with um, shia, with gloss. And it's like, no, I want matte, okay? Um, unfortunately, the home renovation culture isn't very much developed in the Japanese context. So we've got some summaries here of associations of, of colors across different cultural divides, and you can look at them. Um, some of these you, you can question. Um, yellow is generally associated with jealousy across a range of range of cultures and whatnot, which is an interesting interpretation. Um, purple is an interesting one. Authority and power and tradition uh, is a traditional thing, but purple was in certain tones of purple, such as vermilion, um, were actually off limits for anyone other than aristocrats in some cultures. Um, in Japan, uh, you might see here showing up with sin, um, that purple looks a bit uh, iropoi or um, eroi. And I never forget, I was a very bold first year student, but I was wearing a purple shirt to class once. And First year student came over and said, Nane poka chan, yoku fuman. I'm like, eh? <laughs> you're you now. Uh, no, so you're desperate. Um, and in her mind, purple meant desperation. When you I very much hesitate to even wear a purple shirt in Japan again as a as a consequence. I'm not sure where that where it came where that kind of association came from. But there is definitely in the Japanese context this asso association of um, certain tones on Murasaki with Yoshiwara and the uh, geisha and the, um, in the past, kind of in a traditional sense of kind of mizu, mizu shobai. So we do see across certain cultures. Of course, black in Japan is in many places associated with death. Um, 
we often think now that black is the standard uniform of people who are designers, um, but it's only in recent decades that actually black was widely used in fashion. And to a significant degree, it was Japanese um, designers uh, like Koakubo Rei, uh, Yamamoto Yoji and whatnot, who really made black fashionable. Historically in Europe, black was associated, of course, in, in particularly Southern Europe with the, uh, the dress of widows. And you still see that still many widows, even in, in places like Greece today. Um, will older widows will still dress in um, black and of course black was very much associated with uh, some of the Catholic clergy like a Jesuit priest in black um, and in Jewish communities of course ultra-orthodox uh, Jews overwhelmingly dress um, in black so we we see that there are certain subcultures of uh, color associations okay now running down my uh, list here bear with me a moment um, Time flies and we're having fun. Okay. So I want to turn to visual uh, representation of complex information. Screen share. Now there's a um, I've got a num number of examples in this slide set here. Uh, I'll just very briefly speak to them, but you actually have a very nice TED talk by uh, David Candless, who is one of the uh, strong advocates of vis data visualization. Um, normally when we do this class face-to-face, -face, I bring some of the really iconic books in of data visualization to class and people can, can engage with it. So unfortunately we can't do that. Um, an incredibly beautiful one, a collector's item and a first edition sells for a lot. Um, I have a reprint in my office. Whenever you get back on campus, you can come and have a look. Um, probably won't lend it to you because it's one of those books that's so nice people forget to give them back. And uh, I've had to rebuy so many books that I've instinctively lent to people. Um, his early work on envisioning information really is, is um, a benchmark. Uh, for practice in the field and inspired so many more people to think about how we actually represent information visually, particularly in a world of increasing demand for our attention. But now the early pioneers for this were actually cartographers, people who did maps, engineers, early statisticians and whatnot, um, who really wanted uh, people who weren't as trained, as comfortable in the complex information they dealt with uh, to be able to make sense of that information in a speedy way, okay? Um, this is how Tuff describes the issue. The world is complex, dynamic, multidimensional. The paper is static and flat. How are, to, how are we to represent the rich visual world of experience and measurement on mere flat land, okay? Um, so this is not really about just simplifying. This is actually meaningly simplifying, uh, but also where you can, in a counterintuitive way, as you say, actually add more detail in terms of understanding. So you've got micro and macro level reading. So it contains an enormous amount of very precise and useful information, but can be read at various levels, okay? And it's about um, working that data into larger coherent structures um, and that the micro details can be useful. So here's just simply you, something you look at in a glance and you make a sense of something that we all experience, um, especially at least before lockdowns, okay? Um, now this was, someone did this um, by hand. It's quite an amazing thing, okay? Tokyo population densities, they took the statistics, um, they took all the data from at the coup level and then addresses down to the chore level, okay? And then they map that onto one kilometer grids in the greater Tokyo area, and then they colored each one in uh, based on the population density. So it ends up with this. Now, of course, you can scrape the data, you can write an al algorithm to do this, okay? So what was once a, an insane amount of work, you now can generate. Uh, computationally much more quickly. Of course we track um, trains, we go in one direction, that sounds like a bad aging boy band, but anyway, um, which does remind me, years ago on a work trip um, to London, my then 
uh, Shogakse daughter begged me to buy a One Direction poster. It was a very, one of my most humiliating kind of moments, having to go and say, do you have any One Direction posters? And going to about five different stores in London um, before I finally triumphantly came home with them. I should remind her of that humiliator. Um, Japan actually has a long tradition of explaining the complex information and transport systems visually very effectively, even before World War II. And they've been much studied and Tuff's book actually includes some interesting examples of this. Um, even then, um, you still don't necessarily get all the information you want. These, these are one of the best things around. And if you haven't actually discovered that these are on train platforms, those of you particularly didn't grow up in Japan, um, they are absolutely wonderful in terms of being able to read which carriage is the best to be in for transferring at which particular station and whatnot. So really good. Um, the Metro has these. JR generally doesn't have them. And it's really annoying. I get on the JR platforms and I go to look for them and I realize, ah, Metro Janaina, ah, Chikatitsa Janaina. So JR does in some places, but they could have more of them. That said, um, because they want to be able to use the same one throughout the station, they don't have it um, automatically shown in terms of which way, which way is going. So they can put them on both platforms. And then that opens that same question about which is more natural for this. It's the same question as the scroll effect on a, on your computer and people get into debates about um, is going up, you know, if, if the, uh, the direction where the train is going in, should that be up or should that be down? Okay. It's pragmatic. So that uh, it's either, of course, in this context, but they're very interesting questions about how you map direction, for example, onto space. Now I'm very conscious of our time. Um, remind you of something we all know. Um, Japan actually provides a lot of information very effectively here, of course, and I've tried to make it even simpler for foreigners by actually numbering the stations as well. Um, although this is another language. I mean, someone says to me, you know, which, um, which Torzai stations was it? It's T what? I'm like, it's T4, but I never remember T4. Okay. Um, so we actually have to school ourselves in another way of describing something, but to able to, to, to know where to transfer, for example, is quite um, nicely shown. So this famous example in terms of moving through time and space, traditionally complex rail systems, um, to make sure that trains didn't run into each other, the timetabling was actually done through visualization right from the beginning. So complex systems of mobility communicating these dynamics. Um, so this is actually what the visualization of trains um, moving through time and space looked like when the Japanese ran this train. This is actually uh, Surabaya to Yogyakarta. Um, in Java during the Japanese occupation of Indonesia. And this is actually in Tuft's book, where if you see on one side, this is actually the terrain. And then this is how the train moved through station and time. And actually the slant of the line gives you a hint at the speed which they can move. Now, if you had the book, you can turn it sideways and you can see that the train slows down when it goes uphill. So really sophisticated visualization that was done in the early 1940s. Uh, similarly, we're at time, I'll zoom through really quickly through this. Um, with maps, you can see this showing, showing uh, this is a Swiss map, for example, um, how you can color code this. I was in the Boy Scouts, so I know that lines closer together mean that actually you're walking up um, hill, hills a lot quicker. We're familiar with this. Um, and uh, McCandless on visualization, he gives us some really good clues on what works well as visualization by actually using a visualization. So I'll encourage you to read that yourselves. Okay. A um, few other examples here. Um, context of um, COVID, you put up one side. Okay. The uh, fatality rate uh, on the other side, on the other axis, uh, you put the contagiousness and then you can map the illnesses um, and make sense of that. Okay. And then draw implications for this. Um, about um, vaccination and a whole range of things. Uh, which fish to eat are okay. Um, this is a classic uh, cluster representation where things that are quoted more often or appear more regularly are made bigger. Okay, books everyone should read a survey. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird came out biggest, okay, um, because most people mentioned it. Um, here, 
color coded by field and the relative size is uh, the degree to which the myths are more likely to go viral or not. This is a wonderful one. This takes a horoscope, okay? And he scraped all this data on horoscopes and put them together. And what does he find? Something we all know about writing horoscopes, they're incredibly fraudulent, okay? That um, the same words keep appearing regardless of the month. So the art of writing a horoscope is for people to actually complete the story, to find themselves in it even though actually it's um, pretty much written for everyone. And there was a very famous study of done this, this done in the 1950s where people were invited to take a personality test. They got a description of their personality. Overwhelmingly people agreed with the description. The trick was everyone got the same description. Okay. So open text that people completed in a way they wanted to themselves. So when you visualize this, when you scrape the data, from um, 22,000 horoscopes and then match the frequency of the words, what do you find? No difference across the horoscopes, okay? So if you're really into horoscopes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the implication there is you have been diddled, okay? And then um, I'll stop this share and we're at time, but I wanna show you one other very quick share. Uh, another data visualization. Okay, oops, there we go. And it's this one here. Um, so this is a data visualization of relationships, first dates, hookups, all the rest of it. And how many people last in a relationship down to death. So estimated date on first dates and how few actually lead to that lifelong relationship. So if you've been recently unlucky in love, you can take a certain comfort that actually the vast majority of these first dates and hookups, um, you see the hookups generally exit straight away, okay? Um, the first dates, um, you really would be defying the odds that if it actually lasted until death us do part. Um, a friend of mine was a priest till he stopped being a priest and he long thought um, that actually uh, the marriage vows should be changed to death us to part, um, or one of us gets a better offer. Okay, well, on that note, it's quite depressing, isn't it? <laughs> okay, um, but data visualization very often takes all this enormous amount of data that we want to pretend doesn't apply to us, reduces it down to a very single image, and then dares you to say, oh, that does not apply to me because somehow I'm different.